Um, we are going to go on ahead and get started. So I want to say welcome to everyone. We are so glad you are joining us tonight for another installment of our Beit Abu Lafia program with Jason Kaplan. I am the director of the Center for Jewish Living and Learning at the JCC here in Memphis. And it has been such a pleasure to partner with Jason for all of these programs and to work with Shoshana and all of the incredible guests. Um, you've added a level of music and spirituality and talent that I think we are all so blessed to be part of. Um, so I don't want to keep anyone from the amazing conversation that we're going to have tonight. So thank you all for joining. And Jason, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Lauren. And I want to especially say thank you to Lauren and the MJCC Jewish uh, Living and Learning Center and Center for Jewish Living and Learning, excuse me, that has partnered with us for these uh, the series. And it wouldn't be possible um, without the support and um, really the broad reach of the JCC. And I think everyone should know on this call that the JCC plays a tremendous role in our lives here in Memphis. And I know in other cities, but I particularly I know Memphis. So, um, you know, I know we're setting up a Zoom and we're partnering, but um, the reach and the support of the JCC is, is just tremendous. So I just want to say that from the beginning. And thank you, Lauren. And thank you, Shoshana, for hosting and moderating all of these programs. It's been great. And without further ado, our guest is Andy Statman. Um, he has a great bio on his website. And if I read it, I would give away the whole program. So I can't read you the bio. We're going to hear about it as we go. But I want to read this one important thing and then just tell you my background of meeting Andy. On June 19th, 2012, the National Endowment for the Arts announced the Statman, Andy Statman, would be awarded the National Heritage Fellowship, the nation's highest honor in the folk and traditional arts. He performed with other recipients of the fellowship in Washington, D.C. on October 4th, 2012. There, there's a lot more awards and things like that that, that you can look up. I just want to say this is a particular wonderful program for me because Andy, amongst uh, five musicians that I was asking around 2002 to do a program with me in Washington Heights in a small synagogue next to the George Washington Bridge, and I called them up and I was, I don't know, 22 or 23, really excited. I looked younger than I even look now. And, um, and they all said, no, that's okay, but thanks for calling. And no, that's okay, thanks for calling. And I called Andy a couple of times. He's like, yeah, okay. So I was like, oh, good. So I called up those other musicians. I said, well, Andy's coming. They said, oh, Andy's coming? Okay, we'll come too. So that's how my whole program wow. really got started. That's a true story. And um, I can finally admit to you, I used your name as leverage, but 20 good. years later, I think I can come clean. <laughs> I see my um, name's good for something at least. So. <laughs> really, really, I owe you a debt of gratitude for saying yes and, and giving me a chance. And it's built into a really wonderful program. So that all being said, we're really so happy to have you, Andy. Thank you for your time. We're excited to talk to you about spirituality and music and blues and klezmer and bluegrass. So what I'll do now is turn it over to our host, Shoshana, to get us started and uh, get the conversation flowing. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome again to another wonderful session. Andy, it is so nice for you to join us. We have lots of things that we want to ask you and I, we probably won't get to most of them but I want you to share as much as possible. Um, when I was doing a little bit of research about you it was just so many different areas that we could talk about so I kind of want to touch on a few of them. Okay. And I want to start if you would please. I know that you play many different styles but I'm wondering if you could specifically talk about and focus on your career in bluegrass and in klezmer music and we'll start there if that works for you. Well, those are two different stories and right. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I can get very detailed, but um, uh, I guess bluegrass would be the thing to start out with. And uh, that's the first music. There's always music in my house. I come from a musical family and, uh, um, you know, you know, uh, songwriters, vaudeville performers, different, uh, you know, musicians. Um, so there's always a lot of different types of music in the house and where I grew up, I was born in 1950 in an area called Jackson Heights in Queens. And that was, um, pretty, what they call today, diverse neighborhood. And, uh, everyone got along with everyone. You hear all sorts of different types of music happening. So it was, uh, always a lot going on. And when I was around uh, my brother, I have a brother who's about eight years older than me. He got involved in, um, the uh, folk music revival. And uh, 
when I was around 10 or 11, he was bringing home like Lime Lighters and Kingston Trio records and stuff. And then he started bringing home Joan Bias and Bob Dylan records and Dave Van Rock records. And, you know, some of the music I liked, some of it I didn't like. It didn't, you know, I wasn't that into music. Um, I mean, I enjoyed listening, but nothing, you know, um, that really captured my imagination, you know, in, in my like pre-teens, I guess maybe Gilbert and Sullivan, but other than that, nothing much. And uh, he then brought home a record um, by the group called the New Lower City Ramblers, who were, um, it was Mike Seeger and Tom Paley and John Cohn. And uh, they were playing basically um, their interpretation of traditional old time uh, Appalachian music. And then, and I really started liking that. Also, he brought home a record called Mountain Bluegrass, Mountain Music Bluegrass Style, which was a compilation of um, different recordings made in the uh, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area in the late 50s, early 60s. And that was one of the hotbeds for bluegrass, um, certainly as much as Nashville. And um, that really did it for me. I became a, a bluegrass fanatic. And my brother had a, a jug band he was in, and they used to rehearse at our apartment in Jackson Heights. And I, you know, listened, you know, to guitars and the banjo. The thing that really excited me was the banjo. But uh, my brother played guitar, and we had a guitar, so um, I started learning. He showed me some things, and um, back then there was a radio station in Wheeling, West Virginia, called WWVA, and that used to be able to get it. Um, you know, after uh, after ski after sundown, and um, uh, they were like a bastion of uh, country music and bluegrass music, and uh, they had um, you know people who bought um, uh, you know radio time to promote their shows. They'd have live music, recorded music, and on Saturday night they had a, a jamboree. Like I said, it was a fifty thousand watt station. So all the big performers from Nashville and actually throughout the country would perform on there. So um, that's there was a guy on there named Doc Williams who had a guitar method. So I sent away for that and I started learning that. And around the time I was uh, going to be bar mitzvah, I was able to you know use some of that money and buy a banjo and start taking some lessons. And I already had been listening to the music and. Uh, had some development with my fingers and uh, particularly on the left hand and um, played the banjo for a while and then wound up getting into the mandolin. And uh, I uh, was fortunate to study with a guy named David Grisman who became uh, you know, my first major teacher and, and a lifelong colleague and friend. So, uh, so that's, I mean, in a nutshell, that's sort of how I got into it. It's kind of amazing. So. Is it, would you consider yourself self-taught? I mean, I, I know you've had these mentors and these teachers that you've worked with and, and a little bit later, I wanna talk about apprenticeship, but you don't have formal training, right? Not really, no, not, you know, I started with a lot of different people and they pretty much had no real method of teaching when, um, you know, by the time I got to David, I had been playing, you know, gu guitar and banjo combined for three, four years. And uh, he had basically a, a do-it-yourself method. You know, he would say, record this, record this, slow it down, you know, and uh, give me a call when you have, uh, have, you know, some questions. So, I mean, he would show me something and then he'd tell me to lock the door when I left. And he lived in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, East Village back then. And uh, I was living way out in, in uh, Bayside. So I have to take a bus to the beginning of one of the train uh, lines, subway lines. It's about a two hour trip with a mandolin and a tape recorder. And I'd go in there and I, he would tell me what to record. He had, a, you know, one of the a huge archive of historical recordings and live shows that, you know, you couldn't get almost anywhere else, just amongst a small group of collectors. And he would just let me record all this stuff. and. After I'd record it, go home, basically play hooky from school and slow down these things and try and figure out everything and get it exact. 
And after a month or two, I figured out a bunch of things. I had a bunch of questions and I'd call him up and I'd go in and see him. And uh, he would say, uh, oh, this is the way you do this. And that would answer a whole other questions. So the mandolin is a very logical instrument. And uh, so in the course of about, I don't know, two, two and a half years, it took about five lessons. But we, you know, we became, uh, you know, really good friends. And he's, he's only a few years older than me. And uh, so anyway, so I was about 14, 15. I started playing in bluegrass bands. There were bands that used to get together in Washington Square on Sundays down in the, in the village. And there'd be one section where you had people who were into, you know, topical songs. Um, then you'd have people playing old time music, people playing blues. Then you had a group playing uh, bluegrass. So I met a lot of musicians that way and started playing in bands and uh, performing in colleges and on radio shows and actually doing gigs as, you know, 15, 16. So, you know, yeah, so that's, and uh, I'll just keep going here. I mean, I'm, I'd reached the point where I had started developing my own style, but by the time I was like maybe 16 and a half, and I learned, you know, almost every um, recorded mandolin solo um, by, you know, the three or four major innovators in that style and, um, you know, off live recordings. And I've been, I was speaking the language and trying to put it together my own way. Um, but David also exposed me to people like Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli and Joe Venuti and Eddie Lang and, um, you know, different types of jazz. And uh, I started, you know, listening to, you know, the, 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 the swing jazz, the string acoustic swing jazz. And then I started getting into Mingus and Monk. And uh, I remember hearing, you know, I had thoughts of going to Nashville and, you know, trying to get a job with one of the bands. And uh, I remember hearing um, uh, a record on the radio um, called Albert Eiler in Greenwich Village. And Albert Eiler was a saxophonist and composer who was part of what they called the new thing. These were sort of people who were around, um, uh, you know, starting in, 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 in the, you know, I'd say 64, Three sixty four, sixty five, you know, and, and on. Um, they were doing a lot with um, using sounds and tone colors as expression, shrieks, and you know, doing all this really wild stuff, which for like you know, a sixteen, seventeen year old was great. And when I heard it, I, I said, "This is really what I want to do." So, um, uh, you know, I I decided I wanted to play a wind instrument because I didn't want any of the bluegrass ideas. Um, you know, if I went to a violin or a guitar, I figured I'd have patterns under my fingers. And I also felt with the wind, you could express certain emotions you might not be able to express, you know, on a string instrument. And uh, we had a saxophone in the house, we got it fixed and um, started taking saxophone lessons. And uh, that's, um, <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting, I, mean, I was 17. And I mean, I, I don't so, even go, yeah. No, I'm sorry. So you've learned how to play a whole bunch of different types of instruments and types of music in your teens. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I, I learned how to play, I, I, you know, I was an okay banjo player, a mediocre guitar player. You know, I was a, I was a good mandolin player and, and a beginning, you know, reed player. So, um, I mean, amazing. you know, it's, it's not so amazing, but it's-, it is. it's now, now yeah. you know there are a lot of a lot of really wonderful young musicians around. Yeah. So, it's, uh, well, what's know. cool is that as you're talking and you're name dropping all these amazing musicians who came before you and people you've learned from and the type of music you like, Jason is nodding his head. So it's like one musical genius to another. Y'all are fantastic. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping now that we can maybe switch gears just a little bit. Um, a lot of times on these sessions, we talk a lot about spirituality and our role of Judaism, and then how other religions play into this. And so, Jason, I'm wondering, can you just share a little bit about how your spirituality maybe relates to your music? And then if you don't mind, Andy, if you could also share, I know that you've been on a spiritual and religious journey, too. And if you could share some of that with us after Jason kicks us off. Okay. Thank sure. You. Sure. Thanks, Shoshana. And great mm -hmm. introduction by Andy. I mean, I can read about it, but to hear from him, his, his yeah. adventures through New York and, and through the teens and meeting David Grisman and 
Um, you know, we'll talk about Dave Tarras later and, and just, you know, the apprenticeship model, I think is just so wonderful as part of the joy I had in New York of, of meeting Mike Longo, the pianist for Dizzy Gillespie. Um, while we're talking about musicians, I really am the yellow belt, white belt, and Andy's the black belt. I just want to set the stage correctly. Okay. So, oh, um, <laughs> um, so, so um, I just wanted to say that, you know, I, I really love listening to Andy's music. I actually have a bunch of the CDs here. One, I got Andy to sign when I saw him in Richmond, but Everyone can check out Old Brooklyn or what I have the Super String Theory uh, here. The Hidden Lights, a classic. And, um, you know, when I hear the music, I hear also, you know, myself coming from a secular background and choosing Orthodox Torah Judaism. So I resonate a lot with Andy's music because I feel like I hear that adventure there, that seeking and searching and, and looking. So I thought it would be neat today as we got a little glimpse into the uh, background growing up in New York and, and, and finding bluegrass. And we don't mean to race through the uh, program here, but... Um, you know, with, with the limited time on Zoom, we kind of wanted to ask you, Andy, just a little bit about the spirituality and music connection and, and a little bit about your personal journey to Torah and Judaism, if you don't mind sharing or share broadly or, or more specifically, just kind of how the music brought you there or you get you weren't there and then it influenced your music. What, what kind of happened there? Well, I mean, it, it uh... You know, ultimately, you know, particularly on my mother's side, we come from a, a long line of, um, you know, cantors. And um, when they came to America, they got involved in, in, you know, songwriting for movies and shows and, you know, or become musicians or entertainers, so to speak. Um, anyway, I grew up, so I had my grandfather from the Ukraine living you know, with us until uh, I was eight when he died. And my uh, other parents from Poland lived, uh, you know, maybe a 10 minute walk away. And, uh, you know, we had, it, it, it wasn't a religious house, but particularly on my mother's side, we'd have huge seders with everyone and all my great aunts and uncles from, uh, you know, from Poland and stuff like that. So I was, there's all this stuff going on. We had huge Hanukkah parties. But uh, the earliest music I remember, are some of these 78s that, that we had in the house. And, um, and one of them was, uh, I, I just went wild on, was an old uh, Yiddish theater song called Yassel. And probably Dave Tarras was on it. It was like a big, uh, I think it was like a green label Columbia, um, an old, old record probably made in the 20s. Um, I remember they had a song by the Paul Whiteman band, three o'clock in the morning. Um, but that yussel used to really put me in a state of ecstasy. It's basically um, almost like a Hasidic uh, niggin. Um, anyway, a few years later, there opened up a shtibel, a, a, uh, it's an Orthodox uh, storefront shul in, in my neighborhood. And uh, so they sent me there for Hebrew school and um, I immediately related to, to uh, certain things about it. And um, they used to, uh, the, uh, the Rav used to say, he taught us the Aleph bass. And in this, as it turns out, it's old, it's an Alexander uh, Niggin. Um, but whenever you used to sing these Nagunim, everyone would be in a state of ecstasy in the room. I mean, that was, that was one of the best parts of being there. And you know, when it got into uh, the, more of the academic side, it was it was not really so much for me. But uh, I love the rabbi, and I you know. But there was, uh, you know, I didn't really you know. My parents were they came. Uh, my father came from a somewhat observant home, and and my mother, her home was not observant. But you know, her father and mother came from from you know from homes, and you know the. Uh, my grandfather was uh, was pretty learned, you know. He went, you know, he, he went to Shiva as, as a uh, as as a you know before he came to America. So um, I had all this, uh, you know, these experiences there, and also we used to get together on my father's side and play, um, you know, basically records of klezmer music and dance to them, and. Uh, so that's you know some of my earliest musical memories as well. So uh, so that's all there, and I didn't sort of um, get back in contact with that until I started studying jazz, basically. Well, it, well, in that jazz, did you feel the same 
ecstasy of, as the Alexander Chassid, the, the Rav, and, and they started connecting you? What, what was it about the music that made you feel that there's also well, a, a Vodas Hashem or, you know? Well, there's, that, those weren't even words that I dealt with. You know, it was, um, what I liked about jazz was, you know, were the ideas and the feelings that it evoked, you know, particularly, um, you know, I like Mingus and Monk and, you know, I like Burr. I mean, I liked all of it, to tell you the truth. But uh, the most intense was always Coltrane and Monk and, um, you know, Eric Dalfi. I mean, uh, you know, at the same, same time, I started listening you know, to the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and all this. But anyway, so I went to see the musician, musician named Richard Grando, who, uh, and he, I think he worked with Art Blakey. He, was, uh, he studied with Sonny Stitt. He was from out of town and he came to New York. And um, uh, a banjo player, I know, a banjo player, a guitar player, his brother, um, you know, was Dave Horowitz, the great jazz uh, piano player. And um, he uh, oh, he said he wants to play uh, jazz. He gave me this guy, Richard Grandel's phone number. So I went down to see him and, and he said, listen, why don't you just come down? I want to talk with you and see if I want to teach you. So we got there and uh, the first lesson we, we talked about was, you know, do I believe in God or not? Does I think God exists or not? And then he said, okay, I'll, 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 I'll teach you, I'll teach you. You know, so I hadn't even thought of these things really very much. So he was a person who was, you know, came out of a hard bop and, and uh, you know, was into this new, this new thing in jazz. But, um, you know, he also was interested in a lot of the, you know, the singers. So, you know, the, whatever was happening contemporary, he saw, you know, that as vehicles of expression. But he's very much into into Carl Jung and American Indian spirituality and different types of music. I used to call it ethnic music. So that sort of got me going. And uh, I remember I started reading Jung and different, you know, books on Buddhism and this and that. And I remember, you know, I was into the I Ching, if you know what that is. And... And uh, I realized that, um, you know, like the, the um, and this is the thinking of, of me at, you know, 18, 17, 18, you know, um, that I was, I was born a Jew. What am I looking for religion for? You know, I could have been born anything. I was born a Jew. So let me find out, you know, about, about that, find out what I can. So I started going to different shuls, you know, where I lived. There wasn't any orthodox shul. And then I... I started getting interested in, um, uh, I saw some of these Martin Buber books and somehow I got interested in, in Hasidus and um, I went to see the, uh, the, the um, Rav of the Shul where I went to as a little kid, the Orthodox Shul, and um, he sent me out to, uh, he wrote a letter and uh, he sent me out to Crown Heights, the 770. In 770 is where the Lubavitcher Rebbe was. That's that's where, you know, that's that was the center of Chabad. And this is like 1968, 1969. It's very, very different than it was even five, ten years later. So he sent me out there. And uh, I got out there. It was a Friday, as it turned out, you know, in January. And, uh, you know, Shabbos starts very early, you know, and, you know, and, so I'm talking with them, you know, and they, they had, you know, someone put on tefillin with me and this and that. I'd never done that before and encouraged me to buy tefillin. Uh, I, you know, I didn't really know much of anything, you know, except maybe Aleph Beis. And uh, then the question is, um, you know, uh, what are you doing for Shabbos? So, I, you know, I said, oh, I said I'll, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going home for Shabbos. I mean, I didn't, I didn't uh, observe Shabbos in any way. I didn't, you know. I mean, I understood what it was in terms of Shabbos's day of rest, but I didn't really know what, you know. Anyway, so they said, well, how long did it take you to get here? I said, a little over two hours. They says, well, you know, Shabbos is in, in half an hour. You know, you can't, you can't go back. You know, you have to stay here with us. So, so I called the Rav, Rabbi Yaakov Pollock, and I said to him, you know, they're telling me that I can't go back because I expected him to give me a, you know, a dispensation and, you know, say, well, you know, you can... So all he says to me, he says, he says, Andy, keep your eyes and your ears open and, and, you know, and have a good Shabbos. And that was it. <laughs> and so I'm stuck. So they, um, they took me to a rub there and an old, old rub. Um, 
kind of like a mashkiach or something like that, this person, a spiritual um, advisor. And he says, he says, you know, you have this pintle, you have this, this spark in your soul. And he says, if you spend the Shabbos here, it'll burst into a flame. So they, um, you know, I stayed in the, um, you know, in, in the dorms with, with, the, uh, with the, you know, the, uh, the other students my age. And they got me a pair of tzitzis for people who know this, the fringes that you wear that remind you of the commandments. And um, they took me to a mikvah, which is the, the ritual bath. I'd never been in there. And uh, so I went to the mikvah and I came out and they got me a white shirt and everything. And I felt great. And I, I remember when I was a little boy, we used to go up to Lake George, upstate New York. And, you know, I'd come out of the water, it'd be around sundown and dry and, you know, and, you know, I just felt great. And I, and I saw that these, I realized that, you know, these people are, in my own way of thinking, they were setting themselves up for this amazing experience. And then I spent, um, so I went to the shul there. I remember everyone, the Rebbe came in, everyone was like, the, uh, the Red Sea parted and everyone steps aside. And it was, it was small then. It was about a, a quarter of the size that, that, that it is now. And uh, spent the Shabbos there. And uh, I decided to go back with a cousin of mine uh, who was also becoming interested in, in Yiddishkeit. And uh, we went back a few weeks later and we each brought tefillin and I started uh, putting tefillin on. And uh, then, you know, things started, it's a number of years after that, before I, you know, became slow, totally observant. A slow progression started in your 20s from this Crown Heights experience. Well, well, well started in my teens, actually, my late teens. And, and uh, you know, I'm glad it did, because it's, it's something that, you know, some of the, the, um, the, the uh, to be totally Shomer Mitzvah, some of the things that you take on are so, um, uh, so foreign in many ways to what you leave your life as a secular person. Um, you need to really take them slowly and, you know, take them when you can handle them. So I started taking on the big things slowly but surely, you know, and, and uh, you know, I eventually got there. That's, that's amazing. I, I mean, I I, I I feel very inspired by that because I, I didn't know the backstory and just the, that your soul would, would burst into a flame and that you would have this light and connection to Hashem. I feel like what you're explaining to me is what I hear in your music, that I hear that flame and fire in your music. And that's it's amazing that I kind of almost visualize it happening there. It's really beautiful. Um, well, Shoshana, would you like to ask a, another question? Please, mm -hmm. please go ahead. I'm, I'm torn because I could listen to him talk about music andy all day long but i could also listen to you talk about all these stories from religious experiences they're both really special and i love that you get emotional when you talk about them it's very powerful um but we're going to switch back to music for now um and jason and i were talking earlier about how apprenticeship has played such a huge role in your life your career and you've mentioned a few of the teachers that you've had so if you could just share a little bit about some of that with us and some of the people you've worked with worked with and then maybe if you've been able to pay it forward and have people come and work with you and you've been able to help them in their journeys musically um <clears throat> uh well certainly with david grisman i mean he was playing you know working at that time as a uh, you know professional bluegrass musician on the road with a, one of the great singers and guitarists a guy named ed allen red allen and uh you know, great band of uh, seasoned bluegrass pros from the South. And, um, you know, when he got out of bluegrass, he made a, a complete break at, for a while and um, moved out to California. And um, he was sort of a model for me. So I made it sort of a complete break. And, uh, you know, we, um, I didn't, run into him again until uh well i'm not gonna get this a whole other story anyway the uh richard grander was obviously a uh exposure to a lot of ideas and a lot of things and um you know the idea of or learning a lot of different styles of music and having them sort of organically combine these different languages um sort of comes out of him in many ways and uh 
you know, he's, 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 he's no longer alive. Um, you know, but when I, uh, I was in a, in a, in a group of, um, so where should, I'm, I'm not sure where should I go. You know, the, the first real professional gig I had was, um, a guy named David Bromberg, who was uh, signed to Columbia Records, and uh, David was sort of a, um, an amazing guitarist and 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 a good composer and 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 a, and a, and a great showman. He he was one of the first people, if not the first, to really combine a number of different types of American root music in in one 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 show in one band. So. Um, so I joined with him. Uh, I mean, there are, there, there's so many things happening. It's really hard for me to uh, to um, other things that led to that. You know, I don't know where to begin and where to stop. But you know, through playing with him, this is my first real professional gig. And you know, back when I was you know 2021, 20, you know, I always saw this imaginary curtain that 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 separated a highly skilled amateur from a professional. And I was able to see myself after being on the road for a week or two, sort of walk through that. And uh, so he really, really gave me my start. And, uh, you know, I wound up recording with uh, with him, you know, a number of amazing records for other people and meeting a lot of different, you know, great musicians and, you know, touring all over the country. I guess I had a question about Dave Terrace was that yeah. you, um, did you inspire him to start playing again while you studied with him? Was that what I read correctly? It, I think it encouraged him, you know, I certainly encouraged him to start composing again, you know, with, with Dave, um, you know, I'd met, uh, I was in a band called Breakfast Special, which was sort of a very groundbreaking band in, in the bluegrass scene. And uh, one night, uh, I, a friend of a friend was there, came down there named Zeff Feldman, who played um, Balkan percussion instruments in the Santur which is a uh, Persian Hamid Elsimer. And, um, you know, we, we started working together and uh, we both got very much into Azerbaijani music. And um, I started studying the tar with a few different teachers in New York. Also, I was very much into the music from Ypres in Albania. I studied studying the clarinetist there. But um, at one point, I realized that this, this, uh, my own traditional music, as far as I knew, no one was playing it, and that I, I sort of felt a, a responsibility to try and keep it um, yeah. going. So uh, I wound up uh, looking up Dave Taris in, in the un Union Book, and Dave was, you know, one of the two, you know, one of the supreme, you know, genius level, uh, you know traditional Jewish instrumentalists who came over from Europe. And, uh, you know, he'd been very, very popular. And he was sort of semi-retired. And uh, I took a lesson from him. And uh, then I got a call from Vasa Clements, who's, the, you know, who Vasa was, a great, great fiddle player. So I moved down to Nashville. And when I came back, uh, I wound up living right near where he was living. And uh, we started a relationship and he gave me a clarinet. and. and uh, I started, uh, you know, he had no real way of teaching. I was just, the method I learned to use to, 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 from bluegrass, I, you know, I, I slowed down these recordings of 78s. Um, there was a, almost like the spark had been lit in, in, in California and other people in New York were getting interested in this music. And there's a, there was an old time, there is an old time banjo player, a great player who's, um, you know, uh, was uh, had a huge collection of uh, 78s. So was in charge of a huge collection of Jewish 78s from the Evo. Um, name is Henry Sapoznik, and uh, he um, he just made all this stuff available to me. So, you know, I would just go to Dave, and you know, I'd see Dave pretty often. We, I, you know, it was maybe a 15, 20 minute walk, and um, in, in southern Brooklyn. So. Uh, he, I lived in Brighton and then and then uh, Manhattan Beach, and he lived so on one side of the peninsula. And he lived in the beginning of Coney Island on the other side of the peninsula. So I used to walk, and he um, we got really really close, almost like a, a, a you know a grandfather grandson type relationship, 
and he, um, you know, I'd go there, his wife would get us tea, we'd talk, how's the family, blah, blah, everything, you know, and then he'd take out his clarinet, and he'd play for me for about 45 minutes, and I would ask him questions, and I'd say, how do you do this, and he'd say, do this, I said, Dave, would you play this way or that way, he said, no, never this way, only that way, in, in what they've come to call klezmer, this is the traditional instrumental music of the Jews of Eastern Europe, there's a whole sort of like oral way of playing songs. That are, and it has to do with tone, and ornamentation, and variation, and phrasing. And, you know, once you know it, you know it. And you can do it your own way, but you have to know it. Wow. It becomes obvious, to, you know, like you can immediately hear if someone doesn't really know it. You know, so yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things that, that clicks. Um, but uh, a lot of the time when he was playing for me, you know, he would make these hand gestures, like he'd play something and make these gestures, you know, and particular poignant parts. And I would learn so much from these gestures, you know, to be indicating things to me. And, um, you know, at the same time, I started going to different, uh, you know, to shuls in the neighborhood. They were pretty much, um, you know, old shtibalach. They were a lot of uh, older, uh, you know, um, Holocaust survivors or people who came before the Holocaust, but, you know, European Jews some more recent immigrants and, uh, you know, so I became more and more observant and um, began to notice that all, all these hand gestures that Dave w w was making at poignant parts of his playing were the same hand gestures that, 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 that Hasidim made in their davening, in their praying. And, um, you know, as it turns out, Dave came from a, you know, from a Hasidic family and, um, you know, most of the great klezmorum came from Hasidic families. And a lot of uh, what we call klezm music is really instrumental versions of Hasidic music or, or um, you know, compositions that will um, show the inventiveness of, of the player, but they invoke the feeling of a Hasidic dance or, or a Hasidic Hasidic contemplative uh, melody. So, um, so well, you know, so anyway, so I said I had the good fortune to, um, you know, produce uh, Dave Tarris's last record and, and uh, you know, helped to, you know, we got a grant and did a bunch of concerts with him. And uh, he's really an amazing person, a really, really amazing, uh, you know, he, he went from remembering when they, they, uh, they brought Victrollers into the Ukraine to, uh, you know, sing a man on the moon past that. I mean, he, you know, um, he told me, you know, his father's band, his father was a um, trombone player and also I think maybe a Bakken. And they would play for, for the landed estates, the grafs, the royalty in, 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 the, in the Ukraine. And this is when the Ukraine was part of Russia and they were anyway, and he said, you know, on them, they'd hold their balls, they'd wait until uh, to call them until Shabbos was over. And then they'd send for them if it was in the winter, they'd send them in this, you know, like these beautiful sleighs drawn by like six horses with blankets. He said when they came in, they'd give them food and give them gifts. And, you know, it was it's this this whole sort of like itinerant musician thing. While it existed, the the, the really good bands did quite well and and toured around and, you know, the regional bands. Wow. So, amazing. It's amazing to hear the, um, the, the apprenticeship piece. You hear that a lot in jazz about the 50s and 60s had apprenticeship until the colleges came in. And, and I'm sure the colleges have tremendous benefit too. But I personally just love hearing about the apprenticeship, person to person, hand gestures and advice and having tea with them. I think it's just such a beautiful thing. It's, I think it's one of the joys of New York is you can walk to certain masters and say hi to them and, and sit with them. So. That's so helpful. I guess, Shoshana, you kind of wanted to maybe ask Andy if he could play some music. We could talk a little bit about Andy. Abu Lafia. Yes. Well, say something. The, 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 a, lot, a lot of these musicians who were around back then, they were really the end of the line. Yeah. I mean, Dave was certainly the, the greatest of, of uh, you know, of the instrumentalists who came over from East Europe. There were others, but they were not on his level. You know, and there were other people I studied with who were, um, you know, more or less, you know, different styles, but, but, the, but the same way. And, uh, 
you know, one musician I, I studied with a guy named Pericles Halkias, this, this um, you know, Greek gypsy from Epirus. And uh, I know when he went back to Greece in the, maybe it was the 80s, I think John Cohn did a film, did a film on him. Uh, he did, in fact, yeah, he did, he did a documentary on him. And he was really depressed because he said, in the small area where he used to live, he said each, while there was a common unified sound, each town had its own style and its own way of playing tunes and its own specific repertoire as well as overlapping repertoire. And he says he goes there now and it all sounds the same, you know, because of radio and recordings. And he said, you know, all the, I know years ago, there'd be, there'd be, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's apropos anymore because the people have died, but certainly back in the seventies, eighties, people would try to do research to, um, meet with old fiddle players in America who didn't have radio or didn't listen to records to try and get like pure regional styles. Wow. And, uh, but now everything is, is, you know, for better or worse, um, you know, homogenized, but you know, when, when you have this, this, this one-to-one -one meeting with, with, you know, with, you know, you know, the, I guess the, the, the master apprentice thing, uh, you, you really gain just so much. It's such an enriching experience. And, um, you know, it's, you don't really get that through, um, you know, uh, I guess maybe you can get it through stories and things like that. Or if you're into it, you can, you know, get it from, from old recordings and things like that. But even then it's still, you're yeah. still missing out on the, um, that, uh, that, that real human contact. I think yeah. that's very well states it. I think that, that there's a very huge beauty in that. This is, this is a really unique piece of our, uh, series here. We've heard from, uh, Dave Liebman who studied, you know, who sat with miles and things like that, but we, you've really given us Andy, an, a, a, an idea of the devotion you've had to apprenticing deep human contact to pick up your music. So I, I really appreciate that. Shoshana, did you want to um, continue with um, a couple questions? Well, I was hoping, Andy, that you might play some things for us. Um, I don't know how good it's going to come across on, on these these uh, these you know these microphones. I say um, give it a go if you're willing. I think these people would be down for it. <laughs> um, okay, hold on one second. Let me see if this is. Let me see if this is up. Uh... No, this read is, uh, I'm going to have to soak this read. Let's keep going and I'll, I'll, if this, let me soak this read and I'll, uh, sure. Jason, do you want to talk a little bit about and bring us back to Beta Balafia while Andy takes care of that? Yeah. Andy and I had a really nice prep call and we talked about Hasidut and, uh, the great Rebbe's and Jewish philosophy and, and Musa and just, you know, just all the great ideas, what we call hashkafa, you know, the, the outlook and the, the study of the spirit and soul, along with, you know, I think we both enjoy halacha, the Jewish law, but we really enjoy talking about the soul level. So I mentioned Abulafia about how Abulafia said with four Hebrew letters, you could permutate them in all different ways. And with different notes, you could permutate them. And I mentioned how I decoded some of it with the great saxophonist Jerry Braganzi's manuals. I, I loved Andy's response. He said, could you send me some material? I'd love to see this, you know, a lifelong student. And I, I, I said, sure, yeah, I'll send it over. It's, it's really helped me. And I played a little bit on the guitar. And so I, I've, I found that it was just, uh, we just have so much in common in terms of discovering Judaism and love of music and improv and being lifelong learners. So I, it was a really neat conversation, Andy, that we had. I really enjoyed it tremendously. So I think if that when the read warms up that um, if Andy would, you know, play a melody or, or some of the four notes or something like that, um, I, I really enjoyed talking to him about, you know, how important Hasidut has been in his life. And I like Andy how on your website, they, they refer to you as the Hasidic modern Orthodox Jew. It's just still, still, you're still like taking categories and smushing them and bringing them together. And no, that's, that's, I, I, someone made that up. I don't know who made that up. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to, no, do you want to correct that? Do you just, do you want to be without labels? Yeah. I rather be, you know, I'm just, yep. you know, as, as they say, I'm doing the best I can. I'm, I'm, I'm an Orthodox drum. I'm, I, I follow halacha and, uh, yeah. you know, um, I dive in, in, uh, in the Hasidic shul and, uh, you know, but I, um, you know, 
I, I sometimes I'll daven in, in, in a yeshiva because I, I really appreciate that type of davening. You know, sure. I certainly, I read a lot of Hirsch and, and uh, you know, I, I like, yeah. So, I mean, I, it's, it's all um, enriching and, and fascinating to me. And, um, you know, I was lucky. I was, um, I was close with a few uh, Hasidic Rebbes, you know, the, the, the previous Majlis Rebbe in this one a bit, and uh, um, Reb Koenig, Elazar Koenig, who's no longer with us in, in Svat, and, and particularly, yeah, particularly the, um, the Boston Rebbe of, of New York and Ramat Beit Shemesh, who died, and I'm close with his sons, but this, this Chaim Avram, the, the, the Rebbe who I got close to, was an incredible composer, composed probably about, he once sort of embarrassingly told me, you know, wanted to organize him. He, he, he composed like over 4,000 agunim, you know, of all times. And um, he, uh, I used to ask him musical shilas, if I had, if I had shilas, I know um, there were some shilas with certain things I was doing with Yitzhak Perlman, I would, you know, I'd ask him, I'd ask him many shilas, the, the uh, you know, practicing, versus learning Torah, you know, he, he gave me eights on, on all these things, you know, he, uh, and, uh, cause he, he understood, he understood what it meant to be a musician, not just on a, on a, on a Parnassian level, but on an Hashem, on a soul level. And cause he himself was one. And, uh, you know, um, I was very fortunate in that, you know, that's amazing. I would yeah, tell everybody yeah. that a Shaila is a question and um, Eitzah is advice, just to give a little bit of the uh, English quick translation. And uh, my family has a couple of Mojister, uh albums at home. I don't know where my grandfather found them, but they are beautiful melodies. So we had a question in the chat, who made the 4,000 Nigunim that Andy's referring to? So that would be the Mojister Rebbe from- No, it was Boston Rebbe, Boston Rebbe. Oh, it was Boston Rebbe who did 4,000. Wow. No, yeah, I was, know I got, yeah, yeah, I got, I got all, the, the, all those eights from him. I mean, also from the Majestad. But the Boston was, was um, he was born in Europe and grew up a little bit in Eretz Israel, but he came to America early on. So he's, he's, as they say, an American boy, they used to call him. So, <laughs> but he, so he understands the mentality here. But he, um, you know, they're the, the, the sons of the Baal Shem Tov and the Shla, and, and they're, you know, they're, um, he was an amazing, and you know, I mean, wow. I, I used to go to him, you know, he's, you know, me and my wife, they had, you know, and the Rebbitson was it's actually the Rebbitson, the Brandvine comes from the, the, the Brandwine family where they have the famous, uh, not only Ruben, but Naftala Brandwine, who was another amazing um, Cosmo clarinetist back in, in, you know, in the 20s, teens, 20s. And, um, yeah, so that was the Boston. The the um, Mudgets, they have thousands and thousands of Nagunum also. And, right. Uh, the, um, I was aware of Mudgets, but I didn't know Boston had that many. That's 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 new to me. That's wonderful. Well, I mean, um, see, the, I, I got to a point with Klezmer music where it was just another tune and arranging it. And I began getting interested in Hasidic music, particularly when I saw that this was really the roots of or one of the roots of, of what's called klezmer music. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't called klezmer music until recently. That's not what the mm. uh, musicians who played it called it. Um, and uh, you know, Boston has some records out, but the I used to get together with the Reb and his sons with 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 the mandolin, and um, you know, we'd for brag. You know, we, they'd sing, and I, you know, they'd sing the latest compositions, old ones, and. Uh, we did a bunch of in-house recordings. You know, a, a lot of these groups want to keep the music um, more in-house than uh, letting it get out. I understand that. And uh, whenever I recorded anything by, um, like say for Mudgets, I would, you know, I was close, you know who Ben Sienschenko was? He was sort of the main yes. great composer and also the, the, the main interpreter of Mudgets here in America. So, you know, he would show me songs and I'd ask him to get, you know, permission from him or from the Rebbe to record certain things. And, and for the boss and I'd always ask his permission to record something. So I, I never did it without, um, uh, you know, with, without, without their, their, their uh, permission and blessing. <laughs> <laughs> that's very important. That's that's amazing. Again, the apprenticeship, the the permission and the relationship. So, we we are hitting uh, just a little bit over forty five minutes. 
um, where we try to keep, we know how much people have been on Zoom these past two years, so we try to be cognizant of your time. We want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank Shoshana for hosting, Lauren Taub for the support of her Jewish uh, Living and Learning, uh, Center for Jewish Living and Learning. And um, if Andy, we just want to thank you so much for, for coming and get, you know, it's a really, everyone I think just realized it's a five part series with Andy because of the richness of his experiences and the klezmer and the bluegrass world and, and the apprenticeship. We, I think we touched on it pretty well tonight. That's, that's due to Shoshana Sanker. So thank you, Shoshana. Um, Andy, if you don't mind closing us out with a little bit of a melody, if your read is up. Sure, and I just want to, is there anyone that has any questions? I just, you know, because I, I don't, you know, now is I the think, time. I, yeah, I think, I mean, I don't mind if, if anyone emails us a question um, that we'd send to you and then bring it back. But I know that people get really excited about our, our guests and then <laughs> we might. Yeah. yeah. Hold on one second. I got it. Sure. Uh, I just I want to acknowledge. Say, yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jason. We can collect yeah. questions and then use them for moving forward. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Jason. Thank what are you going to say? I just want to thank everyone again. I see, uh, again, Wayne and Jackie Seltzer and Stephen Gwen Wartell and Ellen Ab Appel, I believe. And uh, thank you. And uh, Jerry Cutleroff and Lynn Mervis. And uh, I think my brothers came on, uh, Avram and Gabriel, my mom, Judy and Martin, and Yossi Horowitz, I see is there. And Yoshua Levine. I just want to mention all these people just because it's so nice that you guys came and supported Kyla Wonderman. And, um, and my wife, Michal, is there. Bracha is there. So I hope I didn't leave any with Devorah Leia. So anyways, I just want to thank everyone individually because it's so nice for you to come and support such an amazing artist and, and to, to hear his backstory that when you go listen to those albums, please pick up a CD or, or download, of course. Um, you're going to hear, I think, his story come through. You probably already are listeners. You know, Kenny Warren is on one of them, uh, Between Heaven and Earth. That was, That's uh, exactly right. Very good point. Kenny Warren, who's been our past guest, has been on this, and he was so excited that Andy's coming on. So uh, there's a lot of overlap with all these musicians. They, know, they all know each other. That's how I got them to the program, actually. So. <laughs> you know, I don't know if this read is working, so um, it might, might be shift. Um, maybe we're not going to get this this time. Okay, yeah, give it a whirl. If it doesn't work, then we'll, we'll do a part two. <laughs> It's not really playing. I can get, I can sort of get by maybe. Hold on one second. There's a, there's a rat, there's actually a song that, um, the, the Borsina, who I told you about, Chaim Arben um, uh, wrote. And, um, I played this at, um, you know, for the opening of the ceremonies when I got the, uh, uh, the National Endowment Award. Oh. And um, actually, they usually have those awards on a Friday night, and they changed it to a Thursday night because I couldn't be there on a Friday night because of Shabbos. Very nice. So, Very uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Let me see if I can. Uh... Okay, this this I mean I get through this because of the street. Let me see this. Uh... <laughs>
Uh, I got through the best I could. <laughs> that was kind of amazing. Yeah, was. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Thank you. Through the roof. Very, very. From the neshama to all the neshamas on here, that was <laughs> that was what it's all about. Thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, putting that together with a read that wasn't agreeing and uh, finally agreed with you. That was beautiful. <laughs> well, not really, but okay, yeah. yeah <laughs> sort of try and make it work. Um, yeah. yeah, listen, thank you. Thank, for, thank you all for uh, asking me and for those who came to listen, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're a wonderful guest, Andy. You're a mensch and a, and, a, and a great musician. We do have nephews of the Torsky family here uh, who teach and, and live here, Rabbis uh, Nissan. So um, I'm trying to do all I can to make it uh, worth your time and, and interest to fly out to Memphis. We're going to have to somehow bring you out here. Um, sure, I'd love it. I would love it. Okay, great. So if everyone can talk to me after the call on how to make that happen, I'm sending out this message now. We got to bring this gentleman, Andy Statman. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Have Thanks, a great Shoshana. week and a good Shabbos. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. Everyone have a great week. Any closing thoughts, uh, Shoshana? No, just thanks again, Andy. You were Thank wonderful. You. We just barely scratched the surface, and I think I'm sure everybody wants to know and listen to more. You're wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Jason. Thank Amazing you. As thanks. always, Lauren, appreciate y'all's support. Great. Great. Thank you, everyone. Good night. And I saw Jeremy Weiser, one of the uh, heads of the JCC on. So the Klezmer called him onto the call. It was some magic that brought him in. He came running in when the Klezmer started. That's a really good sign. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> have a great night. Everyone have be blessed and have a great week. Thank Thanks. you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.